There are, let me get my Bible, two types of religion. Do and done. My religion, it's done. Amen. But every other religion is due. You must do this. You must do that. I was talking to your pastor uh, today. By the way, I have enjoyed this. And I have enjoyed this here. And um, your pastor and his wife have, have come our way to visit us. And we enjoyed their company. And uh, coming down here and spending the last few days uh, with him and uh, his wife and getting to meet his family has just been a joy for us. We've enjoyed every day. And uh, I want to say publicly, I appreciate him and his work and labor for the Lord and his wife uh, for the support that she has given him over the years. He and I see eye to eye. Uh, we talk today, and I don't know that there's any disagreement between us, and if there is, we would just leave it alone because that's what I, that's how I treat my friends. I don't get into arguments with my friends. Uh, I might, I like to have discussions with people about what I, how I see things, and maybe they may see things differently, and I'll listen to them. Arguing and debating, I don't do that. But I've enjoyed this week, and I want to thank uh, both of you for hosting us and uh, taking good care of us and being our friends this week. And uh, it's just, it has made it very, very enjoyable for us. And I want to say to this church, thank you, uh, number one, for having me here. But that's a small thing. Uh, I want to thank you for your love for your church and for supporting your church and for not giving up on your church. Your church is your, if you believe what I believe, your church is your family. It's your life. Because even when your own family won't have anything to do with you because of what you believe and what you stand for, you can come to church Sunday and cry on somebody's shoulder and they'll be here for you. Your church family is everything, in my opinion. Your church family means uh, uh, the world. It, it To us, to Lisa and I, and to those in our church, our little church family, and we have a small church, uh, it means the world to us, and they are family, in some cases literally, but in in the rest of them, we are friends, we are brothers and sisters, we are family in Christ, and we cry upon one another's shoulders. I, I share my burdens with my people. I share my faults with my people. I don't try to hide uh, what I am or what mistakes I've made or who I am and how rotten and awful I am. I don't try to hide that from them. I think it's best to let people know that even as a pastor, I go through the same things that they go through. Lisa and I both, we've been through the things that most people that go, go through in life. And um, so it's been a joy to be uh, among people of like mind, like fellowship, and then I want to thank you for standing for the King James Bible, for the Word of God. Um, there are not too many churches anymore that will do that. Uh, I don't get called and invited to very many churches. And pro probably the reason being is because of the King James issue. And um, in fact, I, I got invited to a conference, a prophecy conference down in Dallas, Texas. And uh, so I agreed to go, and it was supposed to be one of these big conferences, you know. It was supposed to be thousands of people there, and just didn't turn out to be that way. Uh, it was, I think it was poorly planned. It was in a bad place. But anyway, um, I got a phone call from somebody related to the conference people, and they said, uh, um, you know, we kind of wanted to talk to you about what you're going to, what, what are you going to speak on? I said, well, I've already submitted it the titles of what I'm going to talk about. And they said, yeah, we know that, but, uh, you know, we, just, you, know, we uh, you know, we want to know if you're going to, you know, kind of push that King James Bible issue. And I said, well, let me say it like this. 
Everywhere I go and the subjects and the titles that I've sent you guys, the teachings that I have and the things that I've discovered have all come from the King James Bible. And I can tell you there's, there's a more than, more than, more than 90% chance that I'm going to say the word King and James in the same sentence together. And I said, if that's going to be a problem for you, I've already bought my airline ticket, but if that's going to be a problem for you, then just reimburse me for my airline ticket and I won't come. I said, I'm not, I'm not coming to start fights and to pick fights and to start trouble and and it's your conference. You can you can have who you ever you want to have, and you can you can tell whoever comes what to say. It's your conference. You're the one putting up the money for it. Oh no no no! It's not that. It, you know it, I, I you know we don't have a problem with that at all. And I'm and I'm just sitting there thinking you're lying to me. That guy lied to me. Uh, but that's what it was about. It was over the King James Bible. Issue. And uh, so I want to commend this church for for with the Word of God. Um, it probably is one of the reasons why there's not 150, 200 people stacked up in the pews here. Um, because people nowadays would rather be entertained and they do not want to go to a church that's going to tell them that their lifestyle, their sinful, wicked lifestyle is in any way wrong with God. They don't want to be told that. They want to be told the opposite, that everything's okay, that everything's fine with them. God accepts them as they are. And yes, it's true. God accepts us as he finds us, but he doesn't leave us the way he found us. He changes us. Amen? And the word of God changes us. And uh, I want to this church to stay the course and to keep going. And uh, God is the one, like I said last night, God is the one who decides who comes to church and who doesn't, who comes to this church and who doesn't. I want you to stand behind your pastor. I believe he's a man of God. I understand that he's human just like I am, and I've made my share of horrible mistakes in the ministry. He will make his share of mistakes in the ministry as well. And when he does... You be like David's mighty men. You surround him and cover him with prayer and say, God bless our pastor. Because as long as that man is standing up for you, the devil can't get to you. Maybe I ought to, maybe I ought to start with that tonight. Turn your, take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe I'll just follow the Holy Spirit tonight. Would that be okay? Ephesians chapter 6. Let me tell you what's against you. By the way, I put up a, a new banner back there on our table. Uh, we're not Bethel Church anymore. We are UFO Pastor Church. No, we haven't changed our name. But um, a few months ago, and then I don't know how I, how I ended up seeing it, but I saw that there was going to be a MUFON um, convention in Las Vegas. MUFON stands for Mutual UFO Network. And um, I looked at it, and I looked at the list of speakers, and it's names that I knew. Most of them were former military people who had had direct contact with extraterrestrial vehicles and their occupants. Direct contact. Military. United States military. These are men who are trained to know what a Russian plane looks like, what a Chinese airplane looks like, what a German airplane looks like, what a Israeli airplane looks like. These are men who are trained to protect our country at all costs. And um, the list of speakers were some of those men that have had encounters while they were in the military with UFOs. And so I prayed about it, and I thought, you know, I just feel led to go and set up a table there and give out our DVDs. I've made several DVDs on the UFO subject. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. 
but anyway, um, I came up with the idea for a website called ufopastor.com. Well, I typed that in, and nobody had ever thought of that before. So I own it. I bought it and own it now, ufopastor.com. And that's the website back there. And there's a guy that runs it for me, does a really great job of it. And every video that I've done where I talk about UFOs is on that website. And um, so we went to this convention in Las Vegas back in, what was it, August, dear? And um, went to this convention, and believe it or not, I'm the weird guy at a UFO conference, okay? And there was a reporter there. He's a freelance uh, reporter, and he writes articles for magazines, websites, different things like that, newspapers and so on, does it freelance, and he's from Germany. He was a German reporter, and he saw that banner, and Lisa and some other ladies from Las Vegas area were there mining the table, and they were passing out DVDs free. And I was in listening to one of the speakers, and when I come out, Lisa said, uh, there's a guy looking for you. I said, who is it? He said, well, he's a reporter. He said he's from Germany, and he wants to interview you. Oh. So I got, I found him, shook hands with him, and he told me who he was. We went into a side room, and he interviewed me. And I couldn't tell you a word that I said, but I mean, it just flowed out of me, Brother Ernie. I mean, it just felt like just the Spirit of God was there, and the words that I said just came right out. And I didn't hold anything back. I didn't try to hide who I was. I didn't say things like, oh, it's not about religion. It's about relation. I didn't, it is religion. We have a religion, amen? Let's not hide behind this thing. But I told him, I said, I believe that these things are in the Bible, are, are found in the Bible, and God knows what they are. And that's why I'm here. Well, he sent me an email a couple of weeks ago saying that a what he called a Protestant European magazine had picked up the article and was going to publish it, and they needed a, a, uh, a promotional picture from me, and I had one, so I, I emailed it to him. So it's going to be published. Now, one of the things that you are bound to know about me is that when I do a video, I don't just put one verse of Scripture in there. I'm going Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, and I just load it up with Scripture. So my hope is that whoever reads that article and sees that ufopastor.com, that they search that out, they watch one video, and God changes their life with it. I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. I don't, know, I don't know if I told this this week or not, but a man uh, contacted me, and he said that um, he was a former Roman Catholic, and he was an older man. He was single. He went to the laundromat to uh, wash his clothes, and he said there on the folding table was a bunch of DVDs from a guy named Mike Hoggard. So as he's folding his clothes and he puts them all in the basket, he looks and decides to take one. He puts it on top of his basket, gets in his car and drives to his apartment, puts his clothes away, pops the DVD in and watches it. Now, I don't know what DVD it was. I don't know who put them there in the laundromat. But he, he watched that one DVD and when he got done, he grabbed his keys, got back in his car, went back to the laundromat, got one of each of the rest of the DVDs that was on that table and went back home and watched, binge watched every one of them that he found. Yes, praise the Lord, because he said, now I want you to know that I'm born again. I'm saved. I've asked Jesus into my heart. And I went out, bought myself a King James Bible. I'm telling you, this book's got power in it. Amen. So if you want to take all those DVDs off that table and find a laundromat somewhere and put them on the table, I won't care. In fact, that gives you something to do this week. Amen? Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. This is what we're dealing with every day. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Joe Biden's not our enemy. Antifa's not our enemy. Barack Obama's not our enemy. Hillary's not our enemy. The Chinese government's not our enemy. Principalities are. Prince is. 
like the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's Ephesians chapter 2. That's our enemy. That's who we wrestle against every single day. Principalities and powers, things that hold power over you that you cannot control, habits that you have, sinful habits. Are you listening to me? Sinful habits that you have that you have no control over. They have power over you. They have power over your flesh, and you can't make it stop. Wrestle. Wrestle with them. Fight them. God's teaching you how to do warfare. God's teaching your fingers how to fight, your hands to know warfare. God's training you like you were in boot camp. Learn how to fight these things off. And if you fall... Get back up because the Bible says a just man falleth seven times, but gets back up again. Get back up. Principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Not, and when I think of the darkness of this world, I think of the moon and the stars. The stars, according to the Bible, are angels. And we know at least, well, we know one third of the angelic realm is evil. And God's going to kick them out of heaven one of these days. Literally going to kick a third of the angels, a third of the stars out of heaven one of these days and cast them down to this earth. They're coming one of these days. And we're wrestling against them. But not, not just the physical darkness that is outside right now because it's nighttime but the spiritual darkness that exists all around us. How many of you have family members who are in darkness right now? Raise your hand. Amen. Fight for them. How do you fight darkness? Turn the light. And against spiritual wickedness in high places. And let me tell you, in Washington, D.C., there's spiritual wickedness going on. At the head of corporations, there's spiritual wickedness going on. At the head of major banks, there's spiritual wickedness going on. At the head of many denominations, in fact, most denominations, I guarantee you there is spiritual wickedness going on. And we're battling these things every single day. They will fight against you. They will try to destroy you. They will de try to destroy this church. They will try to destroy your pastor because your pastor is standing for you and he's like an under shepherd of the great shepherd. And as long as that shepherd's there, the wolves know that they cannot move in. And every now and then, there may be somebody come in this church and your pastor finds out that they're a wolf dressed up like sheep. And all of a sudden, he's casting them out. And you're going, why is he kicking people out? We're trying to get people in. Because your pastor knows that guy's a wolf. I've had to do that before. I've done it. I've cast people out that I knew for a fact were wolves in sheep's clothing that moved down into our church to try to dissemble our congregation. And I'm telling you, your pastor will go to war for you. He will fight you. You back this man. If he's preaching this book, you stand behind him. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right, now look up on the screen here. This is just a portion of um, a teaching that I do on the blood. One day, in fact, I was going to do this for our homecoming. I was going to do a deal on blood. And I didn't know anything about blood. So I sat in my office one day and I said, Lord, I don't know anything about blood. Show me. The blood, show it to me in the Bible, show it to me how it works. And I'll tell you what, I, God showed me things. I just, man, I'm just going, woo, God, that's good. I got excited. But, you know, it, it, it never, I never, I never understood how, like in the book of Revelation, it says they had their robes washed in the blood of the lamb and they were made white. Well, anytime I got blood on my clothes, they were not white. Right? So you have red blood cells, you have plasma, you have 
white blood cells. And what do white blood cells do? What are they there for? In fact, yeah, they're the healers of the body. And I want you to think spiritually now. Remember what we learned last night. This church is a body. You individually, you are, a bo- you are the body of Christ. So if there's anything unclean in your body that doesn't belong there, like dirt or some germ, bacteria, virus, something like that, then the immune system of your body kicks in gear and it sends out white blood cells. And I'm going to show you how they work. Notice Exodus 30 verse 10. Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Leviticus 16, 18, he shall go out into the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Watch this now. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger. How many times? Seven times. We learned that number the other night, didn't we? It means perfection. It means when it is finished, it is finished. Thank you, sister. Amen. Finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So what God is teaching us in the Old Testament shadows is that it's the blood that washes us clean from our sins. Now, let me tell you something that I heard a, a pastor friend of mine preach. I never thought of it this way, but he was dead on correct. In the Bible, let's say a woman, let's say a woman had a child. And according to the Bible, she had a certain amount of days where she was unclean. Now, during that unclean period, she's not to be touched or approached by her husband or anything like that. And she's unclean and she must remain that way for that number of days. Now, here's how some people are. They sin, and they think that because, well, that sin was last year, that sin was five years ago, surely God's forgotten about it already. But just waiting out the number of days does not sanctify nor purify the sinner. Just because you fulfilled the days does not mean you're clean now. Because in every case in the Bible, in every instance where God said something was unclean, there was a purification period, and then there was a washing. You must be washed from your sin. Somebody say amen. You must be cleansed. You must be purified. And the agent of purification for our sins is the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and of ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So number one, white blood cells kill unclean Things like sins, like lies and cheating and lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and pride of life. The blood cleanses us from those sins. And then it covers them completely and rids them from the body. That's what the white blood cells do. Now I'm going to show you something that if you don't just get happy and excited about this, I'm going to leave tomorrow. which I'm going to anyway. (laughs) 
Hebrews 9, 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Notice verse 22, and almost all things are by the, are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Uh, brother, did you hear several years ago a, a controversy in the Free Will Baptist denomination? A paper had been written by a professor out at Southeastern Free Will Baptist Bible College that denied the work of the blood. Did you hear about that? A professor at Southeastern Free Will Baptist Bible College wrote a paper saying that the word blood in the Bible was a metonym, like a metaphor, and that it didn't really mean blood, it meant death, and that Christ's blood was no different than any other body fluid that he had, like the tear ducts in his eyes or his spit or his sweat or anything like that. And that it wasn't the blood that saves us, it was the death of Christ that saved us. The man that wrote that paper was my very first pastor when I was eight years old. And I was going to have him come out and preach a, a 30 year anniversary homecoming at our church. And when I found that out, I went, he's not coming to my pulpit. What he had done, he had gotten so smart with the Greek language that he decided that he knew more than the King James Bible translators did. And he just basically wiped away the doctrine of the blood that saves us. That's wicked. That's evil. Amen? Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, this first John, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, Look at what it says, cleanseth us from all sin. So now, the phrase here, I remember this phrase from biology in, in high school, junior high school, phagocytosis. And it's what white blood cells, it's how white blood cells do what they do. There's three things that white blood cells do in order to heal and purify your body. Number one is engulfment. Number two, degradation. Number three, consumption. And I'll explain all of that here in just a moment. First of all, engulfment, which means covering. When the white blood cells detect something impure, like a bacteria in your body, the first thing they do is engulf the unclean thing. They And watch this now, listen. They cover it completely. 100%. The Catholic Church tells you, oh, you sinned, you did this. Now say 30 Hail Marys, say for our fathers, and give, give money to the poor. Because they say Christ didn't die for all of your sins. You must do penance for the rest of your sins. But that's a joke. That's a lie. Christ's blood covers 100% of all of our sins. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, the Bible says. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt, this is the second part, degradation. Once the blood, the white blood cells cover the uncleanness, they break the bacteria or the virus or whatever it is, they start tearing it to pieces. Remember about that plane crash I told you today? All seven of those people in that plane, they didn't find their bodies. They found 
God did that. So notice this, Psalm 2, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is what God does to our enemies. He breaks them in pieces. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. What happens to the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw when the stone cut without hands goes and smashes into the feet of the image? The image falls and is dashed into pieces like a, like a fine powder like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the chaff of wheat from the threshing floor and it's just blown away of the wind. That's what God does. That's what white blood cells do with the uncleanness in our body is it breaks it all in pieces. Then it consumes it. It eats it. Watch this. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again until they were consumed for their sin of their mouth and the words of their lips. Let them be even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. See, when you consume something, does it exist anymore? So when your wife goes to the refrigerator and says, where's that pie that I brought home? And the husband goes, uh-oh. I ate it. The wife doesn't say, give it back. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Consume them that they may not be. Listen, what did God do to Pharaoh when he's chasing the Israelites? He covered them. And does Pharaoh chase them anymore after that? They never have to worry about Pharaoh ever. Listen, when God forgives your sin, you never have to worry about him. Ever. It's the devil reminding you of what you did. It ain't God. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, the Bible says. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness. What color is bright? Just like white blood cells. That is cool, Brandon. Now, after the white blood cells have finished destroying the enemies, they die. Exactly right. When he said it is finished, what happened, brother? So the dead, this is Samson. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Colossians 1, through death to present you, he is reconciled through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Hebrews 2, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So when the white blood cells have covered your sin, broken in pieces your sin, and consumed your sin, Watch this. Now it's as if they were never there to begin with. 
and then they die. Mm. Mm -mm. Look at Isaiah 1.18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? Though they be red like crimson, they shall be at your white blood cells, people. Isn't God amazing? You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Amen. Now, remember last night I showed you about, I taught you about DNA. DNA is what makes everything in your body. What is the DNA of a church? It is this book. Okay? If a church is using a different Bible, then their DNA and this church's DNA are not the same. They're not the same. And I'm going to show you why tonight. They're not the same. They have two different sources, meaning two different fathers. Two different fathers. We are the sons of God, the Bible says. Isn't that, isn't that what the Bible says? We are the sons of God. That means God has conceived us. We are born again. And God is our Father. We are His children. And He has passed His seed down to us. And it's this book right here. This is why our Bibles match. Remember, I showed you that. You have the two ladders, the rungs of the ladder, the two legs of the ladder, and the four rungs that join them together are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what joins the Old and New Testaments together. That's what ties everything. And, and by the way, I didn't say this last night. That's where the words are. In the joining together of the four base pairs, is what makes the words of DNA. And Jesus is the word, and that's spelled out in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? So it what to me is interesting is that in the joining of the base pairs, that's what gives you the words that make DNA and it's in the four Gospels where the Word of God, Jesus Christ, shows up and dwells in those four books. That just blows my mind. Okay? So, the, church, the, the way the church goes and grows and moves in the direction that it goes in and the fruit that it bears is determined by the DNA that feeds it, that makes it, that makes sense. And I'm going to show you tonight two different types of DNA in your Bible. Matthew 13, verse 24, turn there. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven... Is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. What is seed? The Word of God, the Bible. Is this Bible good? It's great. Amen. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather 
up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together. Now, I want you to understand something. We're living and we are surrounded on every turn by wicked, evil people. Amen? Our neighbors, the people at the grocery store, the people that we work with, even our own family members are against what we believe and what we stand for. We are surrounded by tares, surrounded by them. And we say, why doesn't God judge this nation? Why doesn't God, why does God allow this wickedness to go on? He's letting it go on for a reason. He's waiting for the harvest. He said, the servant said, unto, uh, uh, verse 29, he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. What does burning them mean? It means they're going where? To hell. But gather the wheat into my barn. So we are the wheat if we are truly born again. We are his wheat. He sowed his word into us. It has brought forth his fruit and we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. But we are surrounded by people who are under the control of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So while you may be under the leadership and, and guiding of the Holy Spirit of God, your neighbors, the people you work with, the people who work at the grocery store you go to, the, some of your family members, whoever, they are being led by a different spirit. And that spirit is Satan himself. They're being led by his spirit. Which means at some point, you can love them, but you will have to separate from them. That means when they plan the family reunion, they're always going to plan it for Sunday. Don't they? Because they know you go to church on Sunday. And they know that they're going to drag you out of church to get you to the family reunion. Don't go. Don't go. You say, that's me. Don't go. If you don't love Christ more than you love your family, you are not worthy to be his disciple. That's what the Bible says. Now, now he's going to give the, the meaning of the parable. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The children of the wicked one. Who is that? It's everybody that's lost. Everybody that's lost. And I've, I've seen every doctrine in the world concerning this verse. I've seen, well, that's, you know, that's the Jews. They're, they're children of the wicked one. Or that's, that's all the black people. They're children of the wicked one. No, that's, a, no, it's everybody that's lost. They are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest, and how, when did he sow it? Genesis 3. When he spoke those words to Eve, yea, hath God said. So as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the, of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels and the, uh, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
Now, let me ask you a question. Who knows what tares are? What are tares? Does anybody know? Tares are poison darnel. That's the name, that's the modern name for them. Poison darnel. And here's why it's called poison darnel. They they grow and it's one of these symbiotic relationships. This particular plant grows and there's a particular fungus that only thrives and lives on tares. And this fungus attaches to tares and they live off of each other and the fungus when it's ingested is an intoxicant in that number one it causes hallucination and drunkenness and then it kills you okay poison what's what's under the serpent's tongue poison Okay, so when Satan spoke those words, that's what he was doing to Eve. He poisoned her mind, her thinking, and it worked. So he planted seed in her with what he said. Now, don't tell him, Brandon, because I know you know this. I have two pictures up here on the screen. One of them is wheat, and one of them is poison darnel or tares. Which is which? And see, this is the problem that Jesus was addressing in Matthew 13. How many churches are there in Fort Smith, Arkansas? Is there, you think there's more than 100? Okay, out of let's say there's 120 churches in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Out of those 120 churches, how many people who go to those churches, including their pastors, are going to heaven? We don't know, we don't know, do we? See, we can't look on them and say, oh, I can tell they're not going to heaven, right? Judge not according to appearance, but give righteous judgment, the Bible says. So we don't know who is and who isn't. Some of the people you may deal with throughout the week may be Christians and you didn't know about it. Okay? So the point is that the Jesus was saying we can't, Pull the tares up now because if you pull the tares up, they look so much like the wheat, you might pull some of the wheat up too, and I don't want that. So we're going to wait for something to happen. We're going to wait for harvest because at harvest, everything changes. Green apples turn red. Okay? Green tomatoes turn red. Um, give me another example of how something changes when it's time to be picked or time to be harvested. Bananas, green to yellow. Huh? Jalapenos, green to red, okay, good example. So, now let me, let me do it this way. Two books, both say Holy Bible. One of them is, and one of them isn't. One of them's the Word of God. One of them isn't the Word of God. How do we know the difference? How can we tell the difference? By the fruit it bears. 
Now, let me do this. Make it easy for you. When poison darnel is ripe, it turns black as the ace of spades. When wheat is ripe, it turns the same color as the sun. And what did Jesus say back here? The righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And look at that wheat. What color is it? Same color as the sun. So can you now, can, could his workers now tell the difference between the poison darnel and the wheat? difference between night and day, isn't it? See, this is what God is doing now. This is why he hasn't come back yet. It's not harvest time yet. Sin hasn't come to the world. Who, who bakes bread here? Has anybody ever baked home-baked bread? I thought you did. When you put that yeast in that bread, can you tell when that bread's ready to be baked? Just by looking at it, right? You've done it how many times? Hundreds? In other words, you're an experienced bread baker. You put yeast in the dough. You cover the pan. And you can pretty much tell when that bread is ready, right? Remember what Jesus said? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman who took three measures of leaven, of meal, or three measures of leaven and hid it in the meal. And she waited until the exact right time before she put it in the oven. That's sort of the gist of the parable. And God looks at this world and he says, it's not ready yet. It's not harvest yet. It's not harvest yet. It's not harvest yet. And I want you to think about this. The wheat from, goes from green to yellow. It's transformed. It's changed. When the rapture takes place, what's going to happen with us? We're going to be changed, transformed. You know what I think is going to happen with everybody else in this world? They're going to be transformed too. They're going to be changed permanently because the sin that is in them is going to come to the full. It's going to be ripened, and it's going to be ready to be collected and to be burned. Now, and I have two verses of Scripture up here, Daniel 3.25. On the left-hand side, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, in, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. But then on the right hand, Daniel 3.25, he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, who is a son of the gods? That's exactly right. I'll tell you who it is. It's the Antichrist. He's the son of the gods. I preach this. In, in Kenya, I spent a week in a town called uh, Kilimambogo, and I looked up the Swahili Bible that they have and saw that the Catholic Church got involved in its retranslation, and they changed it. They corrupted it to make it more ecumenical. And I knew, I knew that they had changed Daniel 3.25 from Mwanawa Mungu to Mwanawa Miyungu. Mwanawa Mungu. Mwana means son, wa means of, and Mungu is God. Mwanawa Miyungu, when you add a Y in the word, Miyungu, you pluralize it. So I told those people, I said, do you believe, I said, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? And I said, I learned some I learned some Swahili last night. I said, Mwanawa Mungu. And they said, Son of God. I said, Amen. Jesus is the Mwanawa Mungu. And they said, Amen. He's the Son of God. I said, Yes. Amen. Jesus is Mwanawa Miyungu. And they said, No, 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 no. That's Son of God's. And I said, 
who was in the fiery furnace? And they said, Wanawa Mungu. I said, look in Daniel 3.25 in your Swahili Bible. And when they saw Mwanawa Miyungu, they wept. They got mad. Not at me. They knew that somebody had sowed tares among their wheat in their Bible. The pastor stood up. I thought I was in trouble. The pastor stood up and said, I've heard enough. And I'm going, oh, no. But he said, I realize I've been preaching out of a book, but I have not been preaching from the Word of God. And we handed out King James Bibles, me and Mike Hutzel, and, and ran out. <laughs> you see, because they can read English over there. They all speak in English, but they think I have an accent. Do I have an accent? I don't have an accent. They have an accent. I don't have an accent. Now, let's learn another lesson. This, this is the, how the Bible teaches you things. Mark chapter 4, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. What are the fowls of the air? What do they represent? In Mark 4, 15, he said, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word. So birds in the Bible are a symbol for angels. They have wings. Good angels or bad angels? In this case, bad angels. Ephesians 2.2, 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He has wings. He has power of the air. He uses the air to fly around. So that's who Satan is. Mark 4.7, some fell among thorns, and thorns grew and choked it, and, ye and it yielded no fruit. This is what happens. This is how Satan attacks the word of God. He either sows tares among it or he devours it or watch this now. He will allow, he will try to encourage the growth of your secret sins. Your thorns. Everybody's got them. Paul had one. He asked God thrice to remove it. God said, my grace is sufficient. But everybody's got one. And the devil will encourage the growth of your sins because your sins will choke out the word of God. So, Pastor Ernie, the reason why some people who came to this church, no longer come to this church, or any other church for that matter, is sin took over. And it choked out his preaching and the word of God, and it choked it out, and their life bears no fruit for the kingdom of God. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the love. There it is. Of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. I think we would be, and excuse me for bringing this up, but I think we would be stunned if we actually found out how many men, or for that matter, women, were addicted to phone I think we would be stunned to find out how many people were actually addicted to that. Because the devil's made it so easy to get a hold of nowadays, hasn't he? Hasn't he? So while you say we're king, we only use the King James, the devil's got a trick up to his sleeve to choke even that Bible out of your life. And he'll use sin to do it. Your sin. And the next thing you know, you won't be in church anymore. Jude, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men 
turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we were told by Jude, we were told 2,000 years ago that certain men would creep in unawares and try to destroy the faith that you and I have. Paul warned us in, at the end of the book of Acts, Paul said, I know after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in, not sparing the flock. And what happened to every church that he left? Grievous wolves entered in, not sparing the flock. So in Acts chapter 20, look at this. Uh, in fact, that's what I just read to you. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves. Watch this. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Because Paul knew that Satan would try to destroy the power of the word of God in every church. And it's working. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So they come to you with a cover saying, Holy Bible. But inside that cover that says Holy Bible, is a wolf waiting to devour you with false doctrine. Brother Ernie, you said it the other night. Try to prove to me, if you use an NIV, try to prove to me the doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that they are one. Try to prove it to me with an NIV. It cannot be done. Cannot be done. So, Look up on the screen. There are two lines of manuscripts that all the Bibles in this world come from. And I'm going to show you that. Deuteronomy 32 describes one of those vines. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. So let me just ask you a real simple question. What fruit would the vine of Sodom produce? No, it would provide the fruit of Sodom. How many churches now are accepting homosexual couples? How many... Pastors are coming out as homosexuals. That's the fruit of Sodom. And how did they get that way? The vine of Sodom. Their vine is the vine of Sodom in the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons. You know who the dragon is, don't you? It's Satan and the cruel venom of asps. So it is, yea, hath God said. John 15, 1, we have the other vine. I am the true vine. Notice how he said it. He didn't just say, I am the vine. He said, I'm the true vine, meaning that in me is all truth. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So it is no wonder then that the churches in Fort Smith, Arkansas are just like the churches in Festus, Missouri where they're becoming more and more openly of embracing sodomite couples, sodomite weddings, sodomite pastors, 
Sod, allowing sodomite teachers to teach the children. And you better not say anything against it in that church. That's the fruit of Sodom. And it was produced by the NIV, the New American Standard Bible, the ESV, the Revised Standard Version, the New Living Testament, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Message Bible, and the list goes on and on and on. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, what does it mean when he exalts himself above all that is called God? Well, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Revelation 19.13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So you know how you can recognize a man of sin? He exalts himself above the Bible. He says this, Brother Ernie. He says, now... Take your Bibles and look in Matthew 13, where it says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, the original Greek, however, says something different than your Bible says. That man has just exalted himself above God by altering and changing the word of God. And I used to do it. I used to do it. I was taught by two Bible colleges to do that thing. Correct the Bible because all the Bibles are wrong. Well, then what makes me an expert all of a sudden? To correct something that 54 men spent seven years on, what makes me a five-minute expert on it? Amen? And my wife would say, would you stop giving them all that Greek stuff on the way home? And I'd just get mad. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And let me tell you what I was doing. I was trying to make those people think that I was smarter than they were and that if they didn't get it from me, they wouldn't get it. That's wicked. That was wicked of me to do that. Another gospel equals another Bible. 2 Corinthians 2.17 For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as, as in sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Paul said 2 Corinthians in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, look at verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted. See, the gospel is the Bible, and the Bible is the gospel. And Paul warned us about another Bible, didn't he? So if he says, if he comes preaching another Bible which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And that is exactly what's happened in the Free Will Baptist denomination, the General Baptist, the Southern Baptist, even the independent Baptists, that's what's happened all over the world. They've accepted another gospel because they've accepted another Bible. Where Christ is not the only begotten son, he's the one and only son, which is a lie. Where Christ is not the son of God, he is a son of the gods. That's a lie as well. 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So Paul, Peter is saying the Bible is the gospel. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? The word of God is the gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the only begotten of the Father. 
the word of God, Jesus Christ. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So these churches where they say, Woo, we got the Holy Spirit in us. Woo. I think I need my medicine, dear. Is that the Holy Spirit? Is that the evidence of the Holy Spirit? See in 2 Thessalonians 2, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is the spirit of his mouth? Bible. So, the Catholic Encyclopedia says this. The belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. What the Catholic Church says that the belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith. Now, what does the Bible say? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So, while the Bible says that the Bible is perfect and it's the only source of our doctrine. The Catholic Church says, no, it's not. Who do you believe? The instruction of the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1964 said this, the fundamentalist approach is dangerous for it is attractive to people who look to the Bible for ready answers to the problems of life. Well, that would be me. Because when I'm having problems, that's exactly where you're going to find me is looking in my Bible for the answers to those problems. It can deceive these people, offering them interpretations that are pious but illusory, which, which means it gives them an, an illusion of truth. Instead of telling them that the Bible does not contain an immediate answer to each and every problem. Without saying as much in so many words, fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. It injects into life a false certitude for it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are in fact its human limitations. They say that the Bible has human limitations. Thy word hast thou magnified above all thy name, the psalm says. So, my friend Chris Pinto found this in a Catholic Bible. They had a little encyclopedia dictionary, and it had an index of forbidden books. And here's, this is in a Catholic Bible now. And it says, books harmful to the faith and morals the reading of which is expressly forbidden by the Holy See, meaning the Vatican. Number one, any non-Catholic edition or translation of the Holy Bible, for example, the King James Version. They mention the King James specifically. Now, why doesn't the Catholic Church want anybody reading the King James Version? Because it's the truth. That's exactly right, man. I like your parents. I'm, I'm moving you to Festus. They mention the King James first and specifically. Rule number one, don't read the King James Bible. Now, here's Brooke Westcott in Fenton Court. In the late 1800s, the King of England wanted to update the language of the King's Bible. And so he put it upon Westcott and Hort to undertake that. But they didn't just update it. They revised it completely because they started 
They went using manuscripts that the King James translators did not use, even though one of them was available to them, the Sinaiticus, or no, excuse me, the Vaticanus, it was available to them, but they rejected it because they knew it was wrong. So they didn't use it. But Westcott and Hort did. So the first real challenge to the King James Bible came about as a result of Westcott and Hort coming up with the revised version of the Bible where, they, where it said in Isaiah that, Behold, I, I shall give you a sign. A young woman shall conceive. Not a virgin. So, Westcott and Hort used two Greek manuscripts that date back to around 300 A.D. The Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Vaticanus. Codex Sinaiticus was found in a monastery in Mount Sinai, Egypt by a scholar by the name of Tischendorf. BBC did a, a uh, documentary on the Sinaiticus Greek text. Now, this is the Greek text of the New Testament. And they called it the world's most, how did they put it? The world's most altered manuscript. Because literally on every page of the Codex Sinaiticus, it looks like scribes are having a war over what words should be in the text and what words should be taken out of the text. And they use that as the basis for their translation. Then the Codex Vaticanus, which guess where it's held? In the Vatican. Vatican doesn't let anybody see the entire document. They've scanned parts of it, allowed scholars to see it. They gave Westcott and Hort access to uh, parts of the Vaticanus, and they made copies of it. And the Vaticanus Greek, now this is a Greek text of the New Testament, both of them. And yet... These two documents disagree with each other in just the four Gospels over 3,000 times. They don't say the same thing at least 3,000 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Mark 14, the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. That's what these two documents are. They are two witnesses against Jesus, but their witnesses don't agree even with each other. But these two manuscripts are the ones that are preferred by practically all of the Greek scholars, seminaries, Bible colleges, you name it. These two documents are the ones that are preferred. They were compiled together by Westcott and Hort, and they called it the New Testament in the original Greek, and they based it upon the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus documents, from which came the revised version, 1881. Westcott and Hort were on the translating committee, thus they used the Westcott-Hort Greek text, 30,000 changes in the New Testament alone from the King James Bible. The revised version of 1885 was the first post-King James Version modern English Bible at the time to gain popular acceptance. And it was used and quoted favorably by ministers, authors, theologians in the late 1800s and early 1900s, such as Andrew Murray and Clarence Larkin in their works. And that's from the Wikipedia article. In 1963, Kurt Aland his continuation of the Eberhard Nessel Greek text from 1898, in other words, a man by the name of Eberhard Nessel took Westcott Hort's work and made a Greek New Testament text 
So Kurt Alon and the International Bible Society comes along and they're going to continue that work. It is the Greek text followed by practically all modern Bible translations in any language. So if you have an NIV and you go looking for 1 John 5, 7, which says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, you're not going to find that verse in an NIV, in a New American Standard, in a New English Version, in the Message Bible, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, or any modern translation. You're not going to find that verse in there. And the reason why is that verse was omitted from the uh, Nestle Aland Greek text. When I was in Bible college and had to and took elementary Greek, I had to buy a copy of the Greek New Testament, and it was the Nestle Alon, the Greek text. The King James translators didn't use the Codex Vaticanus, even though they knew of its existence and they had access to it. They refused to use it because they knew it was corrupt. They used what was called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, which has about 5,000 copies where they all agree 95 to 98% of the time as to what the words are of the New Testament. So you have the majority text, 5,000 Greek partial or whole complete text of the Greek text that the King James used, or you have all the modern Bibles using basically these two corrupted Greek texts, and that's why there's such a significant difference between the NIV, New American Standard, Holman Christian Standard Bible, and the King James Bible. They are not the same vine. There are two different vines. Now, here from the 1980s, the International Bible Society's Greek New Testament Committee, uh, starting here, Carlos Martini, Kurt Alon, Alex Whitgren, Bruce Metzger, uh, M. Black, I don't know his first name, and so on. I learned some of these names in Bible college, like Kurt Aland and Bruce Metzger. Let me introduce you to some of these guys on this committee. Now, these guys are the ones who put together the Greek text that all of the modern Bibles are based on. First, Kurt Alon. Here's what he said. If the epistles, meaning the letters that are in the New Testament, were really written by the apostles whose names they bear and by people who were closest to Jesus, then the real question arises, was there really a Jesus? Can Jesus really have lived if the writings of his closest companions are filled with so little of his reality, so little in them of the reality of the historical Jesus? He's doubting the existence of Jesus or he's doubting whether or not Paul actually wrote the letters attributed to Paul. Kurt Alon said, when we observe this, assuming that the writings about which we are speaking really come from their alleged authors, it almost appears as if Jesus were a mere phantom and that the real theological power lay not with him, but with the apostles and with the earthly church. Kurt Alon said that in his book, A History of Christianity. This is Bruce Metzger. He said the books of Moses were, quote, derived from a matrix of myth, legend, and history, which appeared as early as the time of David and Solomon, but that later in modified form became a part of the scripture. So he's saying the first five books of the Bible, part of it is a lie. A myth. And it's not true. So how can a guy who doesn't believe the Bible compile the Bible? 
Jesus said, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. But what did Bruce Metzger say? He didn't believe Moses. Here's Bruce Metzger shaking hands with Pope Paul. Here's Bruce Metzger shaking hands with Pope John Paul II. Here is Kurt Alon shaking hands with Pope Paul and Pope John Paul II. They're awfully chummy in the Vatican, aren't they? The Jesuit superior general said, we don't know what Jesus really said. He's lying, isn't he? So where do you think the vine of Sodom grows at? Daniel Wallace, who is considered a conservative at Dallas Theological Seminary, said this. In all particulars, only the original Greek and Hebrew text can be regarded as the word of God. Now, who knows where the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament are? Does anybody know where they are? They don't exist. There are no originals. So if that's the only true word of God, where does that leave us? Without hope. Something is always lost in translation, always. And yet, what is one of the gifts of the Spirit? The gift of interpretation of tongues. Scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth, though red-letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. This guy's training our preachers who are going into the church. Jesus said, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. So Daniel Wallace doesn't believe that every red letter word in the Bible really is the words of Jesus. So does God love him? Now, let me go back to this picture. I want you to notice this guy is wearing a white shirt and a tie. This guy's wearing a white shirt and a tie. This guy's wearing a white shirt and a tie. This guy's wearing a white shirt and a tie. This guy's wearing a white shirt and a tie. Yeah. His name is Car Cardinal Carlo Martini, Jesuit. He would have been Pope. He was second in line. Bergoglio got more votes than Martini did. Both of them are liberals. 1962, he was the chairman of the Textual Criticism Committee at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. Liberal contender for the papal throne, lost to Ratzinger. I dis he said, I disagree with the position of those in the church that take issue with civil union. It is not bad instead of casual sex between men that two people have a certain stability and that the state could recognize them. He said, I understand gay pride parades when they support the need for self affirmation Vine of Sodom. I told you. What does the vine of Sodom produce? The fruit. So the recent scandal in Rome was that they found a 
bunch of cardinals, Catholic bishops, in a gay brothel in Rome. Imagine that. Now, Delilah. I didn't teach you typology this week. I wish I could have, but she's a picture of a woman, Mystery Babylon the Great. Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart. She sent and called for the Lord to the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the Lord to the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. What is it that drives and motivates most of the whole church growth movement? Same thing, Brother Ernie, that drove me years ago. Because I thought that if I could build the church up, I could make more money. Okay? I'd get a raise. And the love of money really is the root of all evil. So in verse 16, she made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. You know what those seven locks are? Seven spirits of God. Because Jesus is seen in Revelation 5 with seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God. And what did Delilah do? Cut them off. So what is the Delilahs now doing in churches all around the world? Cutting off the power of the Holy Spirit in churches all over the world. Because they're getting rid of the real word of God. Here is the NIV. Again, versus the King James concerning the word hell. In the King James Bible, the word hell is mentioned 54 times. In the NIV, it's only mentioned 13 times. Meaning that all of the rest of the times, the NIV replaced hell with grave, Hades, or realm of the dead. They took hell out of the Bible. Does that change then the doctrine of what people believe? Remember, the DNA makes the creature, doesn't it? God's name, Jehovah, is in this Bible in various ways seven times. But this Bible is the only Bible, including the New King James, this Bible is the only Bible that contains God's name, Jehovah. It was taken out of the New King James, the NIV, the New American Standard, the Holman Standard, and every other modern translation of the Bible, including the New King James Bible. That's it, I'm done. Any questions? Do you have the right Bible? Keep it. Don't let the devil use thorns to choke it out. Distractions of this world. Don't let Delilah cut off the power of the Holy Spirit that's in this church. You know why this church doesn't have a rock and roll band and doesn't need a rock and roll band? Because rock and roll bands in a church, and I have a friend from Bible college, and he's a good guy. He at one time was superintendent of a huge Christian school belonging to a free will Baptist church. You know what he told me? He said, Mike, I don't even know the names of the people who lead the praise and worship team in my church. And I'm on staff. 
And he said, I, and I said, do what? He said, yeah, they are a hired band. They come in, perform their music for the church, and then leave when the preaching starts. And he said, I don't even know who they are. Okay? That church decided, or it had to replace, since it removed the true source of true power, which is the Word of God, since they replaced that, they had to bring in a pep band to get everybody in the spirit or to get everybody pepped up or to get everybody swaying, get everybody into an emotional high because they took out the real power of God that was in that church years ago called the King James. 